Lambeau Field, Fenway Park, the Rose Bowl, the athletic venues that stand as great monuments and landmarks in our sports landscape. This hour on Yahoo Sports Radio, we take you from coast to coast to the most famous stadiums and arenas in all of sports. Stadiums USA Radio. In-depth conversation, focusing on the popular venues across the sports globe, from the pros to the minor leagues to college. The latest news in stadium design, renovations and stadium connections to their communities. Your host, Bill Hayes, and talks with athletes, coaches, authors, and newsmakers who share their experiences and connections to the most storied structures and stadiums in all of sports. The conversation is now. Is now. Broadcasting from Stadiums USA headquarters in Chicago. Here's the man who was behind the mic detailing Michael Jordan's entry into the NBA. And now, he is your official stadium guy. With your ticket to the latest stadium news and information. Here he is, Bill Hazen. Time now to talk about one of my favorite baseball parks. The one I grew up in. The famed Comiskey Park, the original Comiskey Park on Chicago's south side at the corner of 35th and Shields. And this park goes back a long way to the very roots of the American League. From 1910 to 1990, it was the home to the Chicago White Sox. And some of the most famous moments in baseball history have taken place in this wonderful, wonderful stadium. I thought it would be great to visit with Richard Lindbergh, who is a lifelong Chicagoan, a Northside White Sox fan from his early days in youth. That ought to tell you something right there. He is an author, a journalist, researcher, and he has written on many subjects, 17 books. Richard, let's go ahead and get right at it. Tell us about the first time that you went to Comiskey Park. Well, I remember it like it was yesterday, and I still have the same scorebook from that game. And uh, I have about autographs about a half a dozen players who were in that game on that book. It was June 20th, 1964. I was 11 years of age. Uh, took the old Western Avenue bus from Foster Avenue down there. I was so excited. Got sick twice on the bus uh, in anticipation. And then that 35th Street bus, which I transferred to, rolls underneath the viaduct. And there I saw it for the first time, kind of like a, a birthday cake. It was all white and gleaming. And there it was, the baseball palace of the world. The uh, Yankees provided the opposition that afternoon, and, and in typical hitless wonder White, uh, White Sox fashion, they lost one to nothing in 11 innings to none other than Whitey Ford. Just the thrill of being there. Uh, it was the biggest baseball park I had ever seen in my life, and the crisp uniforms with the pinstripes and the old English SOX, the New York Yankees, and all of the aura that uh, they had of that golden era just really solidified my love of the ball club, which really kind of began in 1962, 1963. And by this time, the exploding scoreboard, of course, had been in there for a couple of years, right? Yeah, it, it uh, was debuted uh, in 1960. Bill Veck had the inspiration from William Soroyan's play, uh, The Time of Your Life, where the standing uh, kind of at the end of the stage there is a guy playing pinball all through the play, and he's playing pinball, nothing's happening. And then at the climax of the play, he cashes in, the pinball lights up, and the machine lights up, and, uh, and he's excited. And this was Veck's idea to make an exploding scoreboard, and it was called The Monster. Uh, and it was unveiled uh, in 1960, and the very first time the monster was scheduled to go off, Minnie Minoso hit a pair of home runs on opening day in 1960, and uh, mm. they pushed the button, and lo and behold, nothing happened. And there was a glitch in the scoreboard. Uh, Minoso comes up again in the 11th inning, and the, they, he hits, delivers the game-winning homer in a 10-9 victory over Kansas City, and again, the scoreboard would not go off. And so the Sox became kind of a laughing stock for a while. It took about a week or two to get, to get the problem ironed out. And that same year when the Yankees came to town for the first time, Casey Stengel and his coaches took uh, little handheld sparklers and they lit them up 
when the first Yankee hit a home run in that game. <laughs> yeah, true story. This was a symmetrical ballpark. What a contrast, Wrigley Field to Comiskey Park. In that, Wrigley Field, definitely a hitter's park. Very short in the power alleys. Uh, long down the foul lines, but short in the power alleys and in center. Uh, you were looking at a 368 pop to the power alleys in Wrigley Field, which still is the way it is today. By comparison, Comiskey Park was 392. It was very very deep. You had that strange look in center field a little bit with the corners there. So you had a what a four fifteen, four twenty foot pop to center. This was a pitcher's park, was it not? Well, it was, and it reflected the personality, the temperament, and the kind of baseball that the founder, Charles Albert Comiskey, espoused. Uh, Comiskey was a product of his times. Uh, he owned the White Sox during the dead ball era early in the 20th century, and he believed that the most purest form of baseball was pitching speed and defense, and he shaped the contours of that ballpark to reflect a style of play which was becoming increasingly out of vogue. Uh, the 1920s, uh, of course, changed baseball with the advent of the home run hitters. Mm -hmm. But in 1910, we were still in the midst of the dead ball era. So the ballpark played to the philosophy of strong pitching, good inner defense, and timely singles hitters who uh, would win you a 3-2 to two or a 2-1 to one game. And that, in the long run, uh, really kind of hurt the future of the White Sox. Our guest is Richard Lindbergh, who certainly has written a lot on the subject of Comiskey Park and knows an awful lot about the new ballpark, U.S. Cellular Field, too. And at one point, Richard, as you know, they stood side by side. And I saw some aerial views. I know you've seen the ones that I've seen. And U.S. Cellular Field just absolutely dwarfs uh, Comiskey Park. Introduce the new ballpark to us and uh, tell us a little bit about your uh, likes and dislikes as far as the new park is concerned. Well, the new ballpark opened up in 1991 after six contentious years of public debate, uh, threats of rumors of moving the White Sox to St. Petersburg, Florida, and a referendum in the General Assembly that passed at the midnight hour on July 1st, 1988. So the, the future of the franchise hung in the balance. They had to either get a new stadium or they were gone. It was as simple as that. I wrote a book about the whole machinations and the behind the scenes politics of it and I came to the conclusion that there was no way they were going to stay if they if they didn't get that stadium bill passed. We got a functional uh rather bland nondescript ballpark that was modern in every way but what was quite apparent was the fact that they had cut corners on the final project. Because of such great public opposition to the park from the voters and from a lot of downstate legislators, they decided that they really had to get that ballpark completed under budget. The targeted budget uh, was $135 million, uh, the funds that were overseen by the Illinois Sports Facilities Authority. The ballpark, the final delivery uh, came, uh, the park was $16 million under budget. It came in at one, $119 million. That was the final price. In that $16 million that was lopped off were a lot of interesting amenities and uh, things that might have given the ballpark a lot of character that it lacked in its first decade. You essentially had, like Soldier Field, you had uh, the semblance of a flying saucer sitting on top of the stadium, uh, where you had this huge, huge upper deck, this bowl-shaped upper deck. And the initial complaint that the fans had was that everything was so high up in the upper deck. And after the first two seasons when they had good attendance, uh, it began a chronic drop-off in attendance every single year. Sports talk radio was obsessed with this park and its negative and the fans hated it. There was a general chorus in unison of complaints about that this is a product of greed, that there's nothing, you know, there's, there's no Wrigleyville component to it. Speaking to that point, I think a lot of it, a lot of the criticism was valid. Uh, and in 2000, uh, a lot of these problems were addressed. The blue seating was replaced by a more traditional forest green color seating. Mm -hmm. The upper deck was chopped and lowered. Uh, they started growing some vines on the outside of the wall. Uh, they put in a nicely terraced uh, center field area with a lot of foliage and shrubberies there. And they uh, put st uh, statues of former players. So the ballpark in 2000, 2001, and up to the modern day, 
is essentially a different ballpark than what we saw in 1991, and the improvements have been notable, and they have helped at least make this ballpark uh, an attractive venue for sports. Richard, it's a great pleasure to visit. Uh, A lot of fun to talk about Comiskey Park and U.S. Cellular Field. And our guest, Richard Lindbergh, who is an author and uh, researcher, historian. Uh, He covers all of the bases. And when you're covering baseball, that's not a bad place to be. Richard, thank you for the visit and continued success. Thank you, and God bless. Richard Lindbergh, our guest. 